Morning, everyone. So when I said, my name is Diti Ro. Uh, some people call me Lionel. That's also my name. I go with both names. It's been like that forever. Uh, and yeah, I, I know I know. to some this is like, this is very weird. Where's the guitar guy? I, I get it. I feel the same way. Uh, I am with you. That's what I'm saying. I'm with you. I'm with you. So uh, we're going to look at Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 to 21. Just to give us a small backdrop there. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. Uh, there's been a couple of issues now between them. Some of them, uh, they look at Paul and they're like, man, this guy is just not doing it, you know? He's he's poor. Uh, uh, we, we want a flashy man to preach the gospel. We want something that looks cool, you know, that sounds grand. Paul is not even a good speaker. Uh, so they had moved on in one sense from what Paul was teaching. And they thought, look, man, we're looking for something better. And now here Paul is writing to them, uh, reconciling with them. As the question was today of what is reconciliation, he's reconciling with them. Trying to show them that, no, guys, look, we can't move on from this message. Uh, we cannot move on from this gospel. And I have not moved on from you guys. Uh, I want us to come together again. So this is what Paul is writing to them about. I'll just read the verses for us so we, we, we get into grips. And I'll focus on some things here, like how Paul mentions Christ's love is controlling him. Uh, also, we'll look at the plan of reconciliation as to who designed this plan and how does it work and, and, and all its workings through Paul and all its workings from Adam and all its workings with us and Christ. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who Christ reconciled to us, who reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of, for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. So now, dear friends, as you see what Paul is writing there to them, mentioning reconciliation, mentioning that Christ who knew no sin became sin, this is what I want us to zone in now. Uh, in today's world, where we are probably the most connected human beings ever. Uh, I can know what's happening in the United States, like right now. Some things you find out before 
the best journalists. You can find it out. It can be tweeted right on the second, and you know exactly what happened in Tembisa at what time. And some things for us to find out, it just takes a little push, just a little push of diligence, and you will know everything about that. In fact, just even reading the Bible, if you want to get a good context of what the, the book is about, you could go to YouTube, to Bible Project, and they'll give you a nice context with videos and all these cool drawings, and you'll get it. You'll know what this is about. You'll get the context. That's how easily information is accessible. But not only that, we are living in a day where I can know what's going on in your household as it happens. We have seen it on a WhatsApp status. I don't know. I had a fight with Joy, and I put it there. I will show her. And then you comment, what did she do, bro? That's how easily stuff is. That's how easily accessible it is. So with all this information, all of it, all of it at our hands, easily, easily accessible, we are probably also the worst, the worst at reconciling. We just do not know how to do it. And we are probably the most easily, easily offended with all this information. I can get a context of what this fight was about in seconds. You'll send me pictures of the screenshots of the chats. This guy will send me the voice notes. I know everything about this fight. I know everything about it. But reconciliation might not happen. We're a society where our claim to fame is knowing itself. We are well aware of who we are. We are fully prepared. You know, we, we, we even know exactly what offends us and what must not offend us. I imagine if Stephen did Conrose today, he would have to know exactly what to say because before he's accused of appropriating the culture of the Conros. So we'll, there's, there's so much information, but there's so much offense that's coming through at the same time. Now, I'm just going to read verse 11 uh, to 13. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God. I hope it is also known, uh, known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are in our right mind, it is for you. In this society where we are all knowing, where we know ourselves very well, we seem to not know exactly where we stand with ourselves and God. That's why we have so much self-help stuff coming through. Um, human beings, we, we, we are fallen people. We are far from God. Not only are we far from God, we actually want nothing to do with God. We want nothing to do with this guy. We want absolutely nothing to do with God. That's where we are. When the jig starts, when you're born, my friend, you're born wanting nothing to do with God. Humans are fallen. In fact, one of the best places where you can see as to where we stand, if you look in Peter, in uh, Luke, Luke 22, Verse 54 to 62. You see there, they've captured Jesus. And things are about to get really bad. They're about to get really, really bad. And now, as they're sitting there, they seize Jesus and they're leading him away. I'll just read it here. They seized him and led him away and bring him into the high, high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. You know, Peter... Peter is one of the guys who was with him. He's one of the guys who was the closest to him. Right there. 
I will jump up, man. If they come, I'm your guy. And when they kindled the fire in the middle of the, co- in the courtyard and sat down to get together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light, and looking closely at him, said, This man was also with him. This is the awkward moment in the Bible right here. And then Peter says, Hey, woman, <laughs> I don't know this guy. I don't know him. This is where we are born into. Woman, I don't know him. Woman, I want nothing to do with him. Peter gets a second chance at this. He denied it. And later someone else saw him and said, No, man, you are also one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. I am not with this guy. I do not know who this guy is. You see, Peter's position there is where we are born into. It's where our hearts are at birth. And when you see Paul talking to the Corinthians and saying, knowing the fear of the Lord, at the point when we are outside of reconciliation and outside of knowing and loving and wanting to know or be known by God, we are at the point where we are saying, I do not know the fear of the Lord. I want nothing to do with it. I want nothing to do with it. And we, as a society here today, are part of those people who are most connected, most knowing, having all information at our, at, 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 at our hands. And we also have that position. We also have, the, have, have that position even with our family members. We have all these WhatsApp groups, family WhatsApp groups. You know how many wars are going on in there? You know how many, how many dissension and, and unreconciled things are happening inside those family WhatsApp groups? We in those family WhatsApp groups are in the position of, woman, I do not know that Magoko, I want nothing to do with her. She knows what she said to my mom 10 years ago. I want nothing to do with her. We are not a capable society. Besides us having conflict with God, even amongst ourselves, we are not one. We are not one. And we want apologies. We want apologies. We want apologies. We want people to apologize. As I say, if, if Stephen had controls, he'd be in trouble. And so, we are born as Peter here. And Peter gets a third chance at this. It's now after an interval, after about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. This is our entrance point. This is where we start. We want nothing to do with God. We do not know what you are talking about. And so Paul was facing the same thing. These guys wanted flashy preachers. They wanted people that look good outside. So they want nothing to do with Paul. They want nothing to do with the way Paul says things. This guy can't even speak well. We are looking for something new, something even better. Now the question is, how do we fix this? How do I fix my position with God? How does Paul want to fix his position with the Corinthians? Knowing the flaws that me and you have here today, brothers, we, we, we are flawed humans, man. We are, just, we are just not consistent. How do we fix this? How do we fix the position that I'm standing in with God? This needs a plan. And this needs a plan to be executed properly. Not only executed properly, it will need me to change from what I am now. And so too, God has a plan for this. God has a plan for reconciliation. 
in verse 14, Paul says, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all those, for, he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So now the only way that this guy, even Peter, can be united with God, will need God to do the uniting. It will need God to provide every single ingredient to make this unity possible. And by every single ingredient to make this unity possible, it's a sign, brethren, to show us that the gospel is not a program to help us learn from our mistakes. The gospel is not a program to teach us a lesson. The gospel is a plan that God has to reconcile us to him. When we are reading the Bible, when we are hearing the message of the gospel, this is not a message that you hear and you say, you know what, I will do better. That's not the gospel. The gospel is in its whole entirety. This is God's recipe. This is God's work. This is God's ingredients to reconcile us to him. And he's prepared to do every single thing within that to make this possible. At no point are we required to, there's, 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 no, there's no requirement from us to say, okay, Lionel, I need you to do one, two, three, so that this can continue. No. As we were doing the question of the day in my group, it was very interesting. Um, well, we all asked the question. And for me, I was like, hey, Lionel, how do you do the reconciliation? Man, it's very easy. I don't. It's just so difficult. It's just so difficult. Because I come with my pride and I come with my standards. Like, okay, for me to reconcile with this guy, I need to hear him say this. And then we can start this process. And at some point he realizes that, no, Lionel, you're, you're ridiculous, my guy. I'm not going to do that. And then it's, ah, there you go. You see how he is. So there's just so many standards. There's just so many things that we're putting in the way. There's so many blocks that we can put in, in, in the way of reconciliation. I don't have a plan for it. I don't have a plan for it. We'll just see as it goes. How do we fix this? But God has a plan for it. God had a plan for it even in Genesis. God has a plan for it. One of the things that can further show us that the gospel is not a program to say, now you've learned from your mistakes, we can move on into reconciliation. This needed God to make every single thing for this reconciliation to be possible. Let's move to Genesis chapter 4. At this point in history, I love this chapter because it's one of the things that all human beings long for. Uh, to have your wife and kids. And at this point, you can imagine Cain and Abel didn't have to hand in their CV to anyone. They're fully employed. They have all the land. Everything is going well. That's what you'll think when you read Genesis chapter 4. If chapter 4 stands on itself, this is the perfect start. I want that. I'm working towards that. Wife is happy. I'm happy. Kids are working. They know God. They are bringing offering. <laughs> that is the perfect place to be. But when you read through these verses, now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain, a, um, a worker of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought, uh, brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord regard, had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain... And his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The, uh, the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, 
Will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. Two kids raised very well. They know the Lord, they are bringing offering. Those very same two kids, the other kills the other. What went wrong? Isn't this the perfect start? You realize at this point, I wouldn't blame Adam if he said, you know what, God, I have learned my lesson. I have learned my lesson. There's pain in childbearing. It's hard to get anything from the ground. And now one of my kids is dead. I've learned my lesson. Let's move on. But no. It does not stop there. The gospel and God's work of reconciliation is not what we must learn and how we must change for it to happen. It's not a lesson that's to be learned based on Adam's life experiences. This is God's plan to reconcile us to him. This is God's work. And whatever trials that we go through, whatever trials that we go through, they don't make the gospel. They don't make the gospel. So we can't stand and say, I'm going through the most, Lord God. I'm going through the most. I know the gospel. Look at my life. I've been through the most. That's not the gospel, dear friends. The gospel is still God's plan. And I want to say to those who are ambassadors of the gospel, to those who are preaching the gospel and spreading the message of the gospel, in today's world, this all-knowing place that we live in, you find little things where they say, yeah, you know, the gospel works at church. Uh, there's just some situations where it doesn't really fit in. You know, like like there's, there's some situations where, Lionel, you had a fight with this guy, but we don't really need the gospel there. We need to check uh, what's going on. That's a good question. Are there situations where the gospel does not fit in? Are there instances where we don't need the gospel here? Here we need something more. Now, I don't take this lightly. I know, I know, and I 100% agree this. There's, there's things where you need to go see a psychologist and a psychiatrist and all those things. But there is no place on earth where the gospel has no place. Because what we are seeing now, even on Twitter, I don't know who has the most followings. Should they tweet that some things... Uh, these Christian guys must just stay out of. And some Christians, some Christians will agree. You know, this, uh, like uh, this instance here, I know this does not need the gospel. Uh, Asiamo just needs to go see a psychologist, and he'll be fine. There are some instances that you need professional help. Good shot. I agree with you. But for us now, let's ask God. God, is there a place where this gospel has no standing? Revelation 13, verse 8. It reads, at some point it says there, everyone whose name has not been written um, before the foundation of the world in the book of the Lamb who was slain. So now we are finding in Revelation 13, before the foundation of the world, there's a book written. And in this book, there are names. And this book is talking about the lamb who was slain. So clearly, if we cannot find it in this world where the foundations have been, then if we're going to find a place where the gospel does not have a place to stand or a leg to stand on, I'm telling you now, friends, it's before this verse. 
Let's find a place where before that book was written into. I can agree with you. Perhaps there the gospel has no leg to stand on. But until we don't find that place, until we don't move outside of God, the gospel has all the room and it fits perfectly into every situation. And so ambassadors of the gospel should take it with, with, with absolute boldness and not be ashamed of the gospel because it fits in. This place where this gospel cannot be, it surely it must be somewhere where God has not touched, seen, or has no knowledge of. Because the gospel is a plan that in its completion and its victories brings forth a new creation. Let's go back to Corinthians. Corinthians chapter 2. Um, Paul then says there from verse 18, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. This reconciliation that Paul wants with the Corinthians, from his angle, from his stance, he is coming as one who is controlled by the love of Christ. What is this love of Christ? How does it look like? When does it happen? The love of Christ that Paul is talking about is one of the ingredients that have been necessary to make this reconciliation happen. So Paul is not saying here, I'm controlled by the fact that, you know what, I've been with you guys, and I don't think you guys should move to those flashy preachers. I want you guys to stay with me here and keep what I told you. No, he's saying I'm controlled by the love of Christ to do this. I'm controlled by the love of Christ to do this. I'm controlled by the love of Christ who, when a guy said, I do not know this man, that love did not waver. I am controlled by the love of Christ who, when the guy was asked again, hey, when I think you're one of them, said, man, I don't know this guy. That love did not waver. He's controlled by the love of Christ that is continuing to reconcile even to the point of the cross. When the thief was there, then he says to him, you will be with me in paradise. So Paul is not writing to them thinking, I need us to reconcile so that things look cool between us. They have to look cool. He is writing to them as one who's saying, I am controlled by the love of Christ. And he talks about a new creation. He talks about a new creation. South Africa tried reconciliation. I think it was called the Truth and Reconciliation I'm going to say platform. <laughs> I almost said moment, but I think platform sounds better. Commission. Yes, commission. Ah, thanks, brother. They tried it. And it failed dismally. It failed dismally. So you realize that even with South Africa, economic freedom can never inspire reconciliation. No matter how much land you get back, it can never, it can never make reconciliation possible. So South Africa failed at this. In fact, South Africa is hailed as one of the people who have, we are hailed as one of the people who have done it with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But you come ask ordinary South Africans, no, 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 it's not possible. It's not been done. So when it comes from an economic perspective, this reconciliation cannot happen. When it comes from a Lionel's, uh, Lionel's heart he needs to be mended so that he feels better about himself, this reconciliation is not possible. This reconciliation does not do this new creation, this new South Africa. 
this new South Africa has even fallen. It's, it's just not there. It doesn't exist. Romans 1 verse 16. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also the Greek. He has every right to not be ashamed of the gospel. He has every single right to not be ashamed of the gospel. This is God's plan before creation that God worked out. It fits in everywhere perfectly. Not only that, it's the power of God. So this plan, this reconciliation is also God's power. Paul writing to the Corinthians, you can imagine some guys came there and said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm the powerful preacher here, man. I make things happen. I can save these guys right now. That's not the power of God. The power of God is the gospel. The power of God is the gospel. The gospel is God's plan. And the gospel is God's reconciliation. As he continues to reconcile us to himself. With what he has provided. We bring nothing to the table of reconciliation, friends. We have nothing to offer. We can't come and stand with God and say, you know, I think I, 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 I can do this part. I think I can do this part. As long as you hold it down here. There is no parts that we are taking part in here. This is God's work. This is God's power. Hence, even on the cross, when Christ was there dying, he was still reconciling the world to himself. He didn't say, I need you to be sure about what you're about to do, my man. No. God is doing this. This is God's work. This is God's plan. This is God's reconciliation. God is reconciling the world to himself. And all this is from God. Hence, it results in a new creation. And who else knows how to create better than God. Who else knows how to create better than God? As a matter of fact, our greatest contribution to us as reconciliation is Romans 3 verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's our contribution. We have brought the sin to make this reconciliation and salvation necessary. Nothing else have we offered. Also, the gospel is not what you use to discipline your friends or to discipline your enemies. Paul writing to the Corinthians here could have played that card. But he doesn't. He's controlled by the love of Christ. He's loving to them. He's, he's, he's showing them. He's reiterating a new creation. The fear of God. If I'm out of my, if I look like I'm insane, it's for God. He's just putting God as a knight in shining armor in this. So the gospel is not something that you can use on your WhatsApp status after you've had a fight with your friend. It's not that. It's not that. It's not what we can come with and say, God is watching. <laughs> After we've had our own fights. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. So there's never a point in our Christian walk where we can even come and say about the gospel, yeah, it rooted. You know, even when Honor said that uh, a new series is going to start about uh, we are theologians. I am pretty sure Honor is not saying we're going to do a series on we are theologians. The gospel can pause. That's not what he's saying. There's never a point in your Christian work where you can move on and say, I've moved from the gospel. I'm now in the deeper things. <laughs> it can't be. It can't be. We cannot move from the gospel into the deeper things. This is the deeper thing. This is the deeper thing. The gospel is the very same pool where at the deep end is the gospel, at the shallow end is the gospel. 
At no point do you swim in there and say, I've gone past the gospel. I'm doing backstrokes on this thing. No. This, this pool, the deep end and the shallow end is the gospel. It is the gospel. And also the gospel is not what I call self-inflicted persecution. Where you're saying, I will be on purpose, or purposefully weird and awkward using the gospel so I can get persecution. You know that event where uh, they say, yeah, the song, man. Ah, this song. I, 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 I'm just not hearing the gospel in this song. I, I, I remember at one time uh, at a church I used to go to. Um, I listen to weird music. I, 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 I really love my weird music. And, and this guy we're talking about, uh, 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 avant-garde jazz. And uh, and avant-garde jazz is a mess. It's a mess. So the drummer is going to play one thing. The bass is going to play one thing. The guy on the saxophone is going to play his own thing. And it's, it's a beautiful mess, but if, if, if you've not been listening to it, it really sounds like garbage. And I can agree with that. And, and this guy was saying, yeah, but you see, Lionel, we have to listen to, to music that's uh, God-glorifying, you know, that has order and what to attend, and, you know, like classic. And I was like, what? That's where, friends, you get persecuted. <laughs> and you think, it's for the gospel. No, man, it's not for the gospel. You're really being strange. <laughs> and in the same light where we've been in situations where I think some of my, uh, my, my, my black friends will agree with me on this. Every time I see a black guy who's going to get married, I'm always like, it's going down. <laughs> because there's that thing. There's that thing called lobola. Where now you don't know where you stand now. Now you don't know where you stand. A friend of mine um, was, was getting married and he says his uncle said to him, Hey, look, man. Uh, I can tell you what Lobola is. We go to the family. We speak to them. They give us the bride price. We provide. Amat Lozi, the ancestors, we welcome them to the ancestors. They welcome us to their ancestors. That's what Lobola is. What do you want to do? And I thought, man, that guy is fair. That guy is fair. He's saying to you, this is what Lobola is. What are you doing? So that you don't come to people, friends, saying, I am carrying the gospel and I want to show you, I want to change what you're doing. And when they fight with you, we have to come in the family group and say, Lionel is being persecuted for the gospel. When Lionel is not being persecuted for the gospel, maybe Lionel does not know where he stands. And the uncle knows very well where he stands. He's saying, I don't agree with this. I will do what you say I must do. But this is not Lobola. And that's where even Jesus says, let your yes be yes and no be no. Some things must just be black and white. Just make it clear from the onset, friends. This is what I'm doing. So you don't get persecuted and then claim, I'm being persecuted like this because it's for the gospel. I'm being persecuted like this because I believe one, two, three about God. So the gospel is not our self-inflicted persecution and we do not move on from it. Um, Paul continues, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And he says, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Paul then mentions it again, not counting their trespasses against them. This is who we are before the gospel. We are trespassers. We are where we should not be. We are trespassers. And the work of the gospel, this work where Paul says, all this is from God. 
all of this is from God. All of this is what makes Peter, at some point, if that girl would say, Hey, I know you. You are with this guy. This new creation can boldly say, Woman, 100%, I know this man. This new creation can then say, I am definitely with this guy. This new creation can then say, Yes, I know this man. I was with him. I know this man. I was with him. And that is the gospel. That is where now we have been reconciled with God. That is where we come to him and we confess our sins. And we are reconciled to him. And we can gladly stand and say, No, I know this guy. We can know where we stand. We cannot be unsure of where we're standing. I'm not saying we're going to be perfect. I'm not saying we're going to be perfect. I'm saying we will know where we stand. And so too when Paul is writing them saying, A new creation, behold, a new has come. This new that will come is this very same new that can stand and say, I know who Christ is. This new that has come is the new that even Adam can be found in. So that one does not think, I've learned it, man. God, you have struck me enough. I've learned my lesson. The gospel is not there. It's not a program to, to help us straighten our path so we can be better people. It's about getting rid of the old and behold, the new has come. And all of this is coming from God. It's about coming, becoming a new, the renewing of your mind. And coming to God. We've heard with all the sermons preached with this Awaken series. Where it does not matter if you're two feet but away. Or, 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 or ten feet and you're worse away. We are all far away. We need to come to the other side. Where we have trespassed, we need God to reconcile us to him so we can belong there. As things stand when you are born, you are a trespasser. You are with Peter when he says, I do not know this man. And Paul going through his reconciliation here with the Corinthians he then says to them, therefore we are ambassadors, of, uh, ambassadors for Christ and God is making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. All of these ingredients that Paul has provided to the Corinthians about this great meal called the reconciliation and salvation and knowing God, has not needed their hand. Has not needed their hand in anything. So dear friends, this is where I'm praying that those who are hearing the Bible preached for the first time, that there is a plan for reconciliation. That will be carried out and is being carried out precisely. It's not a failing one. It's not one that has promised us a rainbow nation and is flopping. It's not one that will then post on your WhatsApps on Twitter about your flaws and your sins. This is one that says, you are now me. You are my son. You are my daughter. This is true reconciliation. It's not reconciliation that says, I forgive you, we are cool, but let's keep this distance. It's a reconciliation that says, I hug you, I clothe you, I feed you. You are my son. I love you. It's not a reconciliation that at any point has doubts about who you are. There's no doubts here. 
There's no doubts with this reconciliation from God. As long as it comes from all this is from God, there's no doubts about that reconciliation. There's no doubts about that plan. God even went to the extent of showing Adam that if we think we've, we're going through the most and we've learned our lessons, God, by sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for our sins, is to show us that, no, the gospel is, does, does not stop at you knowing that you're a sinner. I want to show you, I'm going to show you with my son, that the price has to be paid. The price has to be paid. And it's not in your trials. Your sufferings are not what makes up salvation, reconciliation, and the gospel. God had to send his son to die. God had to send his son to die. To shed blood so that his judgment and God the judge can say, yep, I'm satisfied. It does not stop at us knowing and quoting Bible verses. God starts this reconciliation and God carries it through. He carries it through, sends his son to die. And for our sake, he made him sin, who knew no sin. For our sake, he made him sin who knew no sin. I'm going to close off by reading a good friend of mine. Not that I know him personally, but uh, I really like this guy. <laughs> um, and I was so happy when Oni mentioned him. St. Augustine. Speaking about God. He says, you are, act, you are ever active, yet always at rest. You gather all things to yourself, though you suffer no need. You grieve for wrong, but suffer no pain. You can be angry, yet serene. Your works are varied, but your purpose is one and the same. You welcome those who come to you, though you never lost them. You are never in need, yet are glad to gain. Never covetous, yet you exact a return for your gifts. You release us from our debts, from our uh, debts, but you lose nothing thereby. You are my God, my life, my holy delight. But is this enough to say of you? Can any man say enough when he speaks of you? Can any man say enough when he speaks of God? You welcome the lost who come to you, but you never lost them. That, my friends, I want us to take home as a, 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 a huge flag, a banner, they say. With this reconciliation, where when we are born, we are lost. But at the same time, God has never lost us. God has never lost us. This is to say, take comfort in that none of your works have made you warrant being found by God. You have always been in his hand. None of what you do makes you even more worthy for him to hold you tight. Like, I gotta hold on to this one. He did this. You have never been lost to him. Yet at the same time, the judge had to be satisfied and someone had to pay the price for sin and God did this all, that we can be reconciled to him. God did this all, that we can be reconciled to him. I'd like us to bow our heads. I'm going to pray for us. And those who are hearing the gospel for the first time, those who are here for the first time, even those who have been going through uh, life and with all its challenges, might feel that maybe now I'm wavering. I'm not sure where I stand, Lionel. 
God has not lost you, my friends. And if you want anyone to come and speak to, we're going to have elders here. You can come, we can pray with you. We can pray with you. We can, we can speak with you about the word of God. We can go even deeper with it and still stay within this swimming pool of the gospel. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this great salvation. Thank you for this great plan that you have for us, that you've executed victoriously in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can be a new creation in him. Lord God, I pray for those also who are in doubt, that they might not doubt your ability to bring them to you, not doubt your ability of not having lost them. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And we thank you for your love. We ask that, Lord God, you be with us, that you walk with us, that you guide us, that you even open our eyes much more to your mercy and grace. I pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.